It is day 4,471 of Boswell being in business and welcome to Boswell Book Company's virtual event series. Tonight is a very special night uh, where we will be uh, hosting Angeline Bully, uh, the author of Firekeeper's Daughter. Um, and she'll be in conversation with Margaret Newton, the author of What the Chickadee Knows. Um, Angeline Bully is an enrolled member of the Sault Ste. Marie tribe of Chippewa Indians, is a story who writes about her Ojibwe community in Michigan's Upper Peninsula. She's the former director of the Office of Indian Education at the U.S. Department of Education. Firekeeper's Daughter is a number one New York Times bestseller, a Reese Witherspoon, Hello Sunshine, YA book club selection, and is soon to be adapted for Netflix by um, Obama's production company, Higher Ground. Margaret Newton is Professor of English and American Studies at UWM, where she is Director of the Electa Quinney Institute. She teaches American Indian literature, Celtic literature, indigenous language revitalization, and Anishinaabemowin language at UWM. I apologize for that. She is also a Center for Water Policy Scholar. And if I might say, um, I was uh, speaking with the folks at the UWM Planetarium today, and they were looking at ways to celebrate the planetarium, the uh, um, centennial of the planetarium, I guess. And um, there was the Indigenous Voices program that Newton was a part of, and uh, Gene Crichton, the um, director of the planetarium, saying it was perhaps the highlight of all the programming they have done. Um, we are so honored to have you. Reminder, this is a Zoom webinar. You can submit your questions via chat. And with that, I'm going to pass the, um, the program over to Margaret Newton. Thank you so much for joining us. Miigwetchen, Daniel. And um, I did agree to kind of start us out. Um, there is a bit of a tradition of land or water acknowledgements that we often use in the city and we encourage on our campus. And because I'm doing it, I often give a small lecture saying you should do something from the heart, do something that means uh, something to you personally, along with acknowledging the people that were here. So in my case, I recently was asked to write a sort of song poem about our place that we live and acknowledge the nations that are here. So I will just open with that. Um, <laughs> O ma be show me chega me. Feed a go shin ek dan is a dota ma. Gin a gawin a moat, gikin a moat. Man o mini quin a big oak, for o e water me. Giwen a ma. Min o aki min o nippy. Get a bajum o young dev wet a ma. Ejibaba menda mong wa bashka. Mama no nanum young gid wa 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 te sek mis wa bin miji. Gi wen a mau. Dibishko o komisipan. Adizokan of dagik namago young. Jim adon on the egg ae mamaka denum egg. Mikon igwa mikwana kong mashki dakin in owaki. Which in English is give things in exchange here by the great sea. When you arrive, you should know that we mix things together here and we remember what they know the Menominee, the Ho Chunk, and Potawatomi people. Give things in exchange the good land, the good water and listen to stories that are true about the ways that we care for waves and are amazed by fireflies and red willow. Give things in exchange like a long ago grandmother, stories can teach you to be generous to one another and to be amazed when they find you on this island, the living land, the good land. And I just thought that this would be the perfect way to begin a conversation about Angeline's book because this is exactly what she does. She gives us stories uh, that can teach us things important to know, things that our grandmothers might have taught us. So with that, maybe I will now just turn it over to you, Angeline, to talk about the book or maybe read us a passage from it. Oh, buju anin, Angeline Bully, Nidishnikas, Makwedotam, Bawating and Donjaba, Chi Makwech, Chi Makwech. Hello everyone, I'm Angeline Bully, uh, Bear Clan, 
and I'm from, uh, my tribe is uh, Bawating Anishinaabe, Sault Ste. Marie, um, Chippewa tribe. And it's my honor to be here tonight talking with um, Margaret and um, just talking about how our language uh, informs our writing and decisions that we made as authors, um, you know, to include language in the book, in our, in our, in our books. So I'm just really happy to be here. Um, I will read, I think I'll read the prologue. Um, it's just a nice little short read. Um, I am a frozen statue of a girl in the woods. Only my eyes move, darting from the gun to their startled expression. Gun, shock. Gun, disbelief. Gun, fear. The thumb, the thumb, the thumb. The snub-nosed revolver shakes with tiny tremors from the jittery hand aiming at my face. I'm gonna die. My nose twitches at a greasy sweetness, familiar, vanilla and mineral oil, WD-40. Someone used it to clean the gun. More scents, pine, damp moss, skunky sweat and cat pee. The thumb, the thumb, the thumb. The jittery hand makes a hacking motion with the gun as if wielding a machete instead. Each diagonal slice toward the ground gives me hope. Better a random target than me but then terror grips my heart again, the gun back at my face. Mom, she won't survive my death. One bullet will kill us both. A brave hand reaches for the gun, fingers outstretched, demanding, give it, now. The thumb, the, I am thinking of my mother when the blast changes everything. I always find it hard to talk about your book without saying too much. <laughs> so I'm not sure how you navigate that in your readings because it is a compelling and amazing mystery in its own right. Um, everyone that I know though has just really loved the way you pull Anishinaabe culture in you know both a timeless and remembering kind of way but in the in the present. Kids thinking about how to go to college and how to get along, how to start relationships, how to honor their elders. So it's amazing in that sense. Mm, and I wanted to thank you because, um, so my dad is a, a first language speaker. So he um, was born on Sugar Island and he was pretty much raised by his great grandmother who only spoke Ojibwe. And um, so it really was, you know, his first language. And um, my dad left Sault Ste. Marie, Sugar Island area as a young man to join the Navy. And he met my mother. Uh, they, you know, they got married. They settled down in Southwest Michigan. And, you know, and I have, I have four brothers and sisters. And my dad made a really conscious decision not to teach us the language. Mm -hmm. And I used to be angry at him about it. Then when I really understood, when I studied um, federal Indian policy, and I could really see that what my dad had done was a loving decision, because mm -hmm. for him being a dark-skinned Ojibwe uh, boy in, in Sault Ste. Marie in the 1950s, um, you know, it, it, it was pretty rough. And so I think that his decision to not teach us the language was his effort to try to... Um, protect us. Um, but then I know that he later struggled with that and felt badly. Uh, when my children were little, we lived in Mount Pleasant and, and my mm -hmm. husband and I had worked for Saginaw Chippewa Indian tribe and our children were able to attend Saginaw Chippewa Academy, which is a tribally um, funded, tribally operated uh, school. And they would get language lessons from Helen Roy. And my dad would um, be like, oh, that's so good. You know, they'd tell him words that they learned. And my dad was like, oh, that's so good. That's so good. You, and telling me, you got to keep them in the language, make sure they have that. And it was like, I wish I had it to give to them. I, you know, but then, yeah, really realizing that um, it was a loving decision, 
one that he later regretted, but that he and I have talked about and we understand how the legacy of boarding schools, the legacy of um, racism and, you know, that he wanted to protect us. But then on the flip side, there were things that we would do that like we just thought that I thought that's what every family did. And so he couldn't not be Ojibwe in front of us. Like, so there were certain things that we would do, like, well, why don't you put to, you know, cigarettes or tobacco in, in a coffin at a funeral? Like why, you know, doesn't everybody, doesn't and, everybody. <laughs> you know, things, and then realize that when people would, when I would be in a, um, with non-native people and do something and they would be like, why did you just do that? And I was like, wait, doesn't everybody do? So yeah, even though it was a conscious decision not to teach us the language, he couldn't not be Ojibwe around us. And so yeah. I think there were a lot of teachings that we got that he never like consciously thought about. So, That's so interesting how our paths cross and overlap in some ways. I mean, I often talk about the fact that for me, the Anishinaabe heritage that I have not being enrolled is on my dad's side. And so we know our relatives, we would talk about them a lot. And I grew up hearing him tell stories of how he didn't get to learn the language, right? And he can, he can remember a grandmother speaking it, but never understanding it. And so my dad was really, I guess, in the position you were in saying to the kids, you gotta learn this. So when I attended University of Minnesota, quite a long time ago now, he said, take the language, take the language, get to learn it because I didn't get to learn it. So he was the one that I, even now, like the chickadee book, um, you know, the, the poem about the chickadee is one that I always sort of talk about as inspired by my dad. You know, we tried to connect to our dads in that way. And then, so I studied in Minnesota for a while and then moved to Michigan. And I also had a lot of classes with Helen Roy. So I've always counted Helen as one of my early teachers who, she just taught me so much joy connected to the language. And the thing she told me over and over was teach your kids. And so for me, even though I didn't know that much when they were initially very, very young toddlers, they kept learning with me. And so it's been, it's just been amazing to see how the world has changed and a novel like yours that actually includes our language with complete sentences and lots of, you know, context and detail and the young protagonist has respect for the language. It's just, it's amazing. You know, I think both our dads would be proud. And I, um, here in Milwaukee, the other person in town that could also speak the language and teaches it at the Milwaukee Indian Community School, um, Mike Zimmerman actually knew your dad and talks about him fondly and, and yeah. remembers hearing the words from him and talking to him a bit. Yeah, I, so. I wanted my dad to like come over and but <laughs> when he gets around people talking the language like pretty soon I'd be like over here over here and my dad you know and, and all you see is my dad's face being like well the way I heard it was yeah yeah, you know, yeah oh they're talking a really old dialect that old dialect is out in Minnesota that old now. western <laughs> that's right oh my god yeah so <laughs> <laughs> yeah. My dad says that um, that language went to sleep um, yeah. on him, uh, you know, years in the Navy and years not speaking it. The only time we would hear him speak is when my grandma visited, when my grandparents visited. Mm. And he and my ma he and my um, grandma would talk, you know, we they called it speaking Indian. They'd be speaking Indian and right. like, what are they saying? You know, exactly. About us. <laughs> yeah, it reminds me of I had uh, when I lived in Ann Arbor, I had a group of the Swamp Singers and the ladies would come over. All these women of all different ages would come over from, you know, in their late teens to women in their 70s. We had one elder that sang with us. And my very young girls would sit up on the stairway to listen. What are the ladies talking about? What words are they learning? What questions are they asking? I think they learned quite a bit about growing up and being a woman in the world just from overhearing what the, the drum group talked about. So, yeah. yeah. I mean, do you think in your storytelling, to me, as I read the novel, I just felt like I heard that same storytelling style, the slow, I mean, 
introductions of characters in a gradual way where things get kind of, you circle back and you learn a little bit more about a person and then a little bit more later and the way that the story unfolds, do you think that that, did that feel influenced uh, by Anishinaabe storytelling to you? It certainly seems that way reading it. <laughs> I, I'd like to say that I like consciously made that decision, craft a decision, but um, I think maybe that's just how I always heard stories being told, like mm. all these different layers, or if someone else told the similar story, it was always different somehow. There was like another layer added to it. And so I think that just, that's just the style of storytelling that I'm used to. So that was the storytelling that I was right, you know, that I wrote, but I didn't consciously think, oh, I'm going to be very descriptive and, mm -hmm. you know, uh, follow yeah. an Anishinaabe storytelling, you know, that I, I did make a decision um, because I knew that I wanted my story to be um, the hero's journey from an indigenous, from an Ojibwe young ah, woman point right. of view. And the hero's journey that Joseph Campbell has written about, it's like this monomyth that many cultures, mm -hmm. uh, you know, Roman, ancient Roman stories, Greek mythology, different things. Um, it follows different like um, plot beats. Um, mm -hmm. and, and you can look at Star Wars, you can look at, you know, a number of different um, adventure stories that are on, stage, screen, books that follow these similar, you know, the call to adventure and, you know, mm -hmm. the darkest night and, you know, different things. So I was looking at this visual, uh, I'm a visual learner, and so I was looking at this uh, drawing about it and the different, you know, stages that this character would go through. Well, right after that, I was like, I don't know, I was on the internet and my internet searches are just scary and, you know, <laughs> like a squirrel <laughs> took over my keyboard or something. But um, I was looking at a uh, medicine wheel mm -hmm. and I saw the two circles and I put them together and I was like, wait, what if it was the hero's journey from it, from an Ojibwe young woman's point of view and it followed our medicine wheel teachings so that each quadrant, um, tied back to our, our culture and that this could be this full journey for this young woman that would, you know, in this indigenous framework. And so that was a conscious decision, but um, my writing style, um, that, that wasn't um, planned. <laughs> yeah, it is amazing. There's so much embedded in there. When I have people say to me, you know, I'll have friends that are amazing allies of our community, or, you know, I'll have students that totally grew up in the city, and they say, well, how do I know what it's like? What's it like living on the res? What's it like to live up north? You know, the sort of mythic up north, if you're from Detroit or Milwaukee, Chicago, or Minneapolis or something, and it's such a great introduction to that blend of growing up, respecting nature, being able to hear that and have it all around you, but also having, you know, hockey tournaments and, you know, elders gatherings and dinners and, you know, tribal politics, all the, all the same modern concerns. So it's just a great introduction to that community for sure. Yeah. And then too, like, you know, maybe dispelling some of the utopia of, oh, if I would have grown up on the reservation, right. then my life could have been so much different and this and that. And it's mm -hmm. like, well, yes. And there's also that, um, the identity stuff that happens on reservations too mm -hmm. of, oh, you know, your family left. So, you know, maybe you're yep. not as, you know, not enough or too much of this or that. And so I, I wanted to really dive into the identity issues because mm -hmm. that seems to be, uh, it seems to be so pervasive in our yeah. young people, especially. Definitely. Um, I, I've worked in different tribal communities and every community you know, I've gotten to know teens and, and I see different versions of the same, of the same stuff. Um, mm -hmm. and, and so young adult, young adult literature is very much around a theme of uh, claiming your identity and finding your place in your community. And so that's yeah. why I really, you know, wanted to tell this story. Uh, Figuring so out your story. The, yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I'm trying to pay a little attention to the chat because we did say people can put something in the chat and we'll be able to see it. So one thing I would sort of call to your attention, maybe somebody commented on the hearing the audiobook. Um, do you want to talk about doing the audiobook and what what that was like and how that went? So my publisher uh, 
the imprint that I published under is Holt Books for Young Readers, and that's an imprint of Macmillan Publishing. And um, they have just done so great by me. And so they knew that I really felt strongly about having an Indigenous narrator. Mm -hmm. um, I wanted someone that could capture like those cadences of, you know, how, the, mm -hmm. how our elders talk and, you know, different things like that. So they were supportive of that. And we um, kind of put out this casting net, you know, on, on all of our social media channels, like calling for indigenous narrators. And I was able to listen to all of the audition samples. Nice. And Isabella Star LeBlanc was just, she blew me away. Um, the instant I heard her voice, I was like, that's how Donna sounds in my head. Huh. And then when she, part of her audition, she did a little bit with like, uh, the scene in the car when Lily and uh, Donis are driving Granny June to go to this, uh, this yes. the center downtown for lunch. And, and she just, she got Granny June perfect. And I was like, her. Ah, her. Perfect. That's amazing. Yeah. That's pretty fun. And yeah. then being able to work with you to work with her on pronun <laughs> pronunciations, because I, I can hear the language and I can pick mm -hmm. out but I'm so not confident in my ability to speak it. And so I was not the authority about how Isabella should be pronouncing different things. And I really appreciated the hard work that you did. Um, Cause when my dad spells things, he spells things phonetically. And right. I had to make a decision if I was gonna go with a phonetic spelling, which might've been helpful to non language speakers but I also wanted it to be a teaching tool, like the if the book could be used in classrooms, not just yes. for the story, but for the the, the langu language. Yeah. Um, it made sense to follow the double vowel system, and that's where your expertise was just so immensely helpful. And then with Isabella and her and the pronunciations, so well, it worked out well. Chi maguetch. It was an honor to do it. And we had, while I was doing that, I have a, a second year class on campus and they've all had, you know, the grammar and the introduction for a full year. But the second year class, it was an assignment in class. <laughs> as I was in, oh as I was editing and sending things to you, I said, all right, here's what I sent off today. Let's read these. Let's think about these sentences. And so they had fun with it already. And of course, um, on our campus, actually, we love the book so much. We do have... Um, Right now, I think it's 28 people with the Office of Indian Ed Teacher Prep Scholarships. And we gave out on our campus 100 copies of the book so that all of our students that are on the scholarship got a copy. All of the students in the second year language class got a copy. And then we gave it out to a lot of the allies on campus that had been really supporting our students and helping us make Native voices more visible. And it's just, it's been fun. It's been like a very organic reading group just so that people could get a, a genuine introduction to not only one real character but an entire community you know that's the other thing that I love is you get to meet aunties and grandmas and you know leaders and people who are followers people who are a little dangerous or a little crazy like you get the whole range of a community so we've had a lot of fun with your book in Milwaukee for sure <laughs> and we'll continue. Uh. That's wonderful because I didn't want to write, I didn't want to write stereotypes. I didn't want to write flat. I mean, who wants right. a flat character? Who wants to? And so I really wanted to show like characters that you felt like if you walked into our, um, our Nokomis Mishomis Center mm -hmm. to have lunch that you, you know, that you would recognize people yeah. that you know, the way that they talk and laugh. And, you know, I just wanted it to feel very familiar. And, um, and because we are so diverse in our community, mm -hmm. you know, there's so many differences between tribes and then within tribes. And yeah. I, I just wanted to capture that, like not fall into the noble savage um, stereotype. Yeah. Uh, so nuanced layered characters. Yes, definitely. I mean, well done in that sense. We're often trying to help people see that with, you know, for us, you have different communities and there's no stereotype. And it's not really fair to do that with any category. You can never look at a person and actually know their background. But 
I often say to other teachers, you look out at a class and especially on our campus and within our city, odds are pretty high. You've got someone who identifies as American Indian and they're either Ho-Chunk or Lumbee or Naida, Potawatomi, I mean, you can't tell. And I think for a lot of folks, they want to know one or two things that can help make that easier. And really you just have to get to know folks. And then yeah. our students are even often learning their own background a little bit as well. So it's, it's great to have something where you can say here, here, this will give you a sense of the broad diversity in just one, you know, Anishinaabe, that's a large diaspora here in the Great Lakes, but it's really only one. I mean, you go a little bit east or a little bit west and you've got completely different language and culture groups. So yeah, this was a lot of fun. Yeah. I'm trying what to are see. Some of the reader questions? I, I don't have the chat pulled up. Yet. Yeah, I'm gonna see. I'll pay attention here for a minute. So we've got one person saying, so interesting to hear your family story about your original language versus English. Same is true for many immigrant families. Um, someone's mentioning they spoke Spanish at home when they were little, but then started school and the parents said they shouldn't, shouldn't speak, uh, should speak English at home. And so the result is they can pronounce Spanish perfectly, but don't really speak it. And then, um, oh, I don't know. This is a Daniel question at the end. It, did they carry your audiobook at Boswell? Now that we've talked that up, <laughs> now everyone that read the book will want to hear the audio as well. Um, and then somebody commented, I'm a first year teacher and I loved your book. I would love to use Firekeeper's Daughter in my classroom someday. Are there certain ways you envision the book being used in the classroom? Um, really, I highly recommend um, high school. Um, I, I, I've had people ask me about middle school and, and you know, the publisher uh, suggested age is 14 and up and really, mm -hmm. um, you know, I wouldn't feel comfortable having middle school uh, read it without parents reading it first, really. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I do dive into some difficult uh, topics, um, but I'm, I'm confident of that, they, that they're handled with care. Um, so there is a, a book discussion guide that's available, and I'm hoping that um, Morgan Rath with my publisher, who's, who's attending can put in that information. And then also uh, uh, my publisher worked with a teacher from Oklahoma who's indigenous and she put together a teacher's guide that aligns with uh, Common Core, um, you know, state, nice. state things. And, and so there's this general like book discussion guide and then there's the teacher's uh, guide. And the teacher's guide follows uh, the four parts of the book. And, and so that's really good that it, it allows for in-depth uh, discussion or assignments um, nice, based yeah. on each section um, of the book. Oh, that is good. And I know that uh, there's been adult reading groups as well. We had at the Indian Community School here in Milwaukee, which has been around now for like 50 years, the staff there read the book. So um, we, there were questions then about the pine suck and little people and all kinds of things where you had folks who weren't familiar in depth with any one of the particular cultures, but had, you know, were working in an environment. Sometimes they were learning about a different culture. So it's, it's also, I mean, it's amazing mystery at an adult level. Absolutely. So. Yeah. Thank you. I knew it would be that upper edge of young adult and yeah. into adult crossover. And so, um, I'm really thankful when people don't uh, pigeonhole it into yeah. young adult only because I, I think that um, as adults, we, I enjoy reading young adult. Mm -hmm. It kind of makes me think about choices that I made when I was a young woman that might have changed the trajectory of my life. Mm -hmm. And um, I just really appreciate the style of storytelling sometimes that YA um, what, that young adult seems to be more responsive to social um, mm -hmm. social equity issues qu more quickly than adult publishing. I, I think that's one of the strengths of young adult is, you know, the, the young adult readers aren't afraid of, you know, challenging and taking things, taking big issues on and um, yeah, I like that's that. a really good that's point. A good way to do that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yep. And Morgan did, for those who are checking, 
um, Morgan did put the, the links to the, the teacher's guide and the book club kit. Um, so that's, that's helpful too. I don't know if folks have other questions. Um, no. I, okay, I have a question for you, Margaret. Yeah. Would you rather go bottle picking with John Z. Kiwaden, mm -hmm. um or go joyriding with Minnie Manitou, Minnie Mustang, and <laughs> or um, garage sales with Granny June, or medicine picking uh, with Sini Nimki? I have to say garage sailing with June. <laughs> Because I imagine being at that garage sale with her and you know how it is in a small town that you go to a garage sale and sometimes you run into things that maybe has already been at a garage sale yeah. or you know when they got it and why they don't want it anymore, <laughs> you know. So I imagine it wouldn't be about the things. There would be a lot of stories and a lot of good gossip <laughs> going with her. Yeah, she's a she's a great character. I mean, but they all are, right? I mean, I yeah. think that speaks to the diversity that you've got in there. Um, now I'm watching here, someone also wrote, can you speak on the effect of gaming on tribal communities and why some tribes don't have gaming? Are there negative effects to gaming? Um, you know, either one of us could probably say something about that, but you yeah. know, go ahead. Well, I think that my book really does. Um, I wanted to tell a story about a uh, an Ojibwe community that has gaming and have it be like lucrative which not all gaming, not all tribes, mm -hmm. tribes have gaming and mm -hmm. not all gaming enterprises are lucrative. Some right. are basically um, operating as employment programs for tribal members, mm -hmm. um, you know, and, and, you know, barely breaking even, but keeping tribal members employed. Um, and, but I thought it would be interesting to tell a story about a tribal community and this new money and how that changes the power dynamics um, because economic power, especially in a community that hasn't had it. So in Sault Ste. Marie, uh, you know, the tribe took the city to court because my grandma lived in the section of town that was like where all the Indians lived. It was within the city limits and it didn't have um, sewer mm. system. Um, you know, still had outhouses until like, you know, the mid to late seventies. And so I remember like we would visit our grandparents and we'd be using an outhouse, but we lived in a, in, you know, she lived in the city of Sault Ste. Marie and, um, you know, I just, yeah, that's, I, I just, and now the tribe is the largest employer. Um, at one point it was the largest employer in the upper peninsula of Michigan. I believe that, right? Yeah. And so I really thought that that was an interesting dynamic about yeah. maybe, and, and I think too, like tribal communities that think that gaming is going to solve all the problems and it does, it does address many, but it also creates others or there's always, there is all, there are always unintended consequences, um, you know, to policy, to you know, different, different decisions. And, and so I, I wanted to dive into that and just give a different take on, you know, beyond what people might think about rich gaming tribes or, right. you know, per capita. I just, I really wanted to tell a nuanced story about it so that people would understand that it's not salvation and it's not damnation. It's like, right. like how Aunt Teddy says, you know, per capita, it takes, it amplifies whatever's going on for that individual, for that family, mm -hmm. in that community. Like that's, yeah. that's how money that's does. That's true. Yeah, that is so true. And I think that it's so important, the point about it's just not the same, even within one community, it's not, even, it's not the same across so that, you know, you have some communities where just based on their location or their own political background, they don't have any of those economic resources. And then you have some nations where it's been huge and it grew too fast and it causes other issues. Like you say, right. unintended consequences. Right. That's a good way to put it. I'm doing a bad job watching the chat. One, This is one that's a fun one for you to answer, I'm sure. The story behind Donis's name. Someone asked, what's the story behind Donis's name and how did you choose it? Well, my first job working in a tribal community 
one of my students was named Nadonis, and I always just mm -hmm. thought that was such a beautiful name. And then finding out that it means my daughter, mm -hmm. um, I was like, wow, that's beautiful. Um, but it, it worked for my story to name her Donis because her, you know, Donis translates to daughter. Mm -hmm. And I felt like, um, so Donis's white mom from the wealthiest family in town gets pregnant as a 16 year old with, um, and, and the Donis's father is Levi, uh, Levi Firekeeper senior and he um he's a hockey player and from you know a poor Ojibwe boy from Sugar Island before they before the casino before there was money um and her father ends up not being in her life but I I wanted her mom to stand up for her on certain in certain ways and for her mother Grace uh, to insist on this name for her daughter, that she couldn't give her daughter uh, Donis's father's last name. And so she was determined that she was going to give her um, this name of daughter. Um, and, and just showing the, like, Grace would pick her battles. And so naming Donis was one thing that she, you know, as, as a 16-year-old, um, you know, that right. they insisted on. Yeah, to think that through. I mean, that's, that is such a good point. Um, somebody also asked, kind of related to that, um, is there a story behind the blinking into memories that Donis does throughout the book? Um, I think that um, sometimes being able to dis disassociate um, in stressful situations and kind of daydream mm -hmm. yourself out of them um, is, is actually a pretty common way to cope with emotions or situations that feel overwhelming. Um, and, and so I had that where, you know, when Donna is missing her father um, so much that she would like kind of blink and imagine, you know, if, if he was right there and high-fiving Coach Bob, yeah. high-fiving, you know, at the hockey arena watching her brother play or knowing that he would have been in the stands cheering for her during her hockey games. I just really wanted to show the ways that grief, um, the different coping mm -hmm. methods that people come up with to um, get, through, get through situations where they're yeah. missing, missing their family member so terribly. Oh, that's a good, that's a good example. I mean, I think it reminds me too, of in our family, the girls, you know, there's thing, a few words and phrases that would, they'll try to use every day. I tried to, when they were young, I said, you can't have a, a phone and start texting unless you use the Ojibwe every day. <laughs> so they would get in the habit of texting me in Ojibwe. And, you know, we would have conversations about their favorite phrase. Of course, you know, we were always saying to each other, you know, gizog in. And we'd talk about that as they got older and studied the language. I talked about how if you say gizog in to someone, you're saying, I love you, but you're also saying, I'm connected to you. I'm sort of open to you. It's why that word is similar to our word for lake, zagaigan, or the word for opening, zage. And so I remember as teenagers, I would tell them, you, know, you, should, you should learn to say, nizagadis, I love myself as well. So they would talk about moments where you need that. Like you say, that sort of blinking or how do you get through something, having a way to get through that. Um, so there's another question too, which is a good one, um, the hockey. I mean, I, I certainly grew up in Minnesota and you got, I remember a point where you say, well, why do they let non-natives play in the NHL? Isn't that the Native Hockey League? <laughs> if you're from Northern Minnesota, Michigan or Canada, the little NHL, that's the Native Hockey League, right? <laughs> so um, is there, somebody asked, have, did you play hockey and where does your insight on hockey come from? Okay, this is how I'm, one of the big ways that I'm different from Donis. I've never played <laughs> hockey. I can barely ice skate. And um, my son, my oldest boy, Chris, was, oh. is my hockey expert. My <laughs> expert. I, yeah, and I would text him and be like, hey, what would it be if this and this and this? And he'd be like, oh, yeah, that's a, you know, slap nice. shot to the top shelf. That means this. I'd be like, oh, okay. <laughs> But, Another language. <laughs> it, yeah, all, it's funny how uh, sports, different activities, uh, you as a person who studies language, 
everything has its own language. And when I went to work for uh, the U.S. Department of Education, I think the first two weeks I felt like I was um, among in a land of people who spoke a foreign language and I was not at all fluent. I had to write down ac acronyms and go look them up afterwards because everyone talked in this shorthand and I was like, what? Um, so yeah, that's just, but living in Sault Ste. Marie for as many years as I did, I think I lived there for 15 years uh, in my tribal community. And when your town has more ice arenas than pizza <laughs> places, you definitely live in a hockey town. And so it's impossible yeah. to not pick up hockey. Right. Yeah. yeah. When the big events in town happen at the arena, <laughs> you know, then you know, yeah. right? Yeah. 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 Someone else asked too about the elders. Are the elders in the book based on elders that you know? Some you know, are. Or are they just mixed? Some are, some are definitely inspired by some people, you know, people that I know. Mm -hmm. For example, Granny June is inspired by my cousin Elaine's grandma. And I thought she didn't like me because every time she would start talking to me, it was like we were in the middle of an argument and she would just like greet me by yelling at me about something. <laughs> and I was like, <laughs> what did I do? But then as I realized that she, you know, that's just how she was, I would take her to garage sales around <laughs> Chippewa County and she would search for pristine hardcover James Michener. And I remember one time um, I turned the corner too quick, uh, a corner to a curve too quickly and my tire squealed and she said well that's one way to take a corner and I was just like oh, okay I'll slow it down a bit the character but yeah I just I I love my elders and I wanted to pay tribute to them in all the beautiful ways that they you know some of them are raunchy and some of them are just so funny and some funny without like even trying um, and, you know, nobody is perfect. And, you know, you kind of hear some hints about some skeletons in the closet. Um, yeah. But I just wanted to give this full, this richness to our tribal elders. Um, they lived some pretty full lives and, you know, survived a lot of horrific things. Right. And, right. and, and just, you know, that they still have so much to share with us. I, I just, I loved that. And such a sense of humor too. I think a lot of people don't understand if you've got a couple of elders sitting around, it's not all like serious teachings at all. It's not all like, I'm gonna make sure you learn the language. Some of it is just plain laughter, just the real good medicine of just laughing and just yeah. knowing, you know, stories about who you are. Um, yeah. Then there's another one too, I guess, which we alluded to, but I think anybody that reads the book, it is a common question that I've gotten when people read the book and then they say, what's with the little people? What about the little people? Um, so the question here is, did you grow up hearing about little people? And you know, I guess really, why did you put them in the book? Yeah, so Tommy Orange gets a question similar to this. Anytime he talks about his incredible book, They're There, mm -hmm because there's a bit in there about spider, uh, spider legs coming out of a wound in his leg. And that really happened. And people are like, how could a spider leg get, you know, like, what is that? And, and he doesn't have like a thorough explanation. He's like, we don't know. Like we saved it and then the dog ate the napkin that had the spider leg in it. So we don't know what, you know. And it's like, you know, growing up, just the little people were just, yeah, we would hear about, I heard about this elder who, um, you know, went missing for two days on Sugar Island. And when they found him, you know, he said the little people took care of him and everyone was like, oh, okay. And I just, you know, mm -hmm. it, I just wanted to speak to that. And yeah. I think sometimes in literature, when you write about something like that, I think that publishing wants to categorize it and label it as um, magic realism or like they'll put different names on it and it's like no that's just you know it's just little people <laughs> it's just little people oh yeah and my dad my dad has seen the little people so 
you know, mm-hmm. I, yeah, he was, t- he was tending fire for one of the fasting camps and he likes taking that night shift because he says that's when all the interesting things happen. And, you know, he was sitting at the fire middle of the night and he, you know, saw the corner of his eye. This, he said this little wee woman that was just kind of sitting there, yeah. just sitting there. And he said, he knew if he like looked at her, or, you know, tried to engage, she would be gone. So he just kind of like looked at her out of the corner of his eye and finally, you know, his eye got tired and he kind of like looked and, and then she was gone. And, hmm. but yeah, and that's just something that's like, yeah, my dad, my dad has seen them. Yeah, we've yeah. I've heard stories about them and we have little people. Another element to, I think, just include in a very natural way. I mean, we have all kinds of things that are uh, common in mainstream culture and then other things that just don't get brought up, don't get shared. So, so that's great. And um, there are other indigenous cultures that talk yes. about little people. Oh, yes. Yeah. Just not specific to Ojibwe. I, right. and, and that's what is really interesting to me. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, I would agree. I, I grew up in a family that has also Irish connections and I had one grandpa, my grandpa Joe O'Donnell, and he would talk all the time about, well, you know, because there actually is a streak of uh, Ojibwe and Irish connections, partly because people were coming to the city um, when a wave of Irish folks were coming. So there's a lot of Ojibwe that have Irish connections. Um, and my grandpa would say all the time, you know, like these little people, these connections, it's, it's common. It's all over the world. It's not just one culture, really. Um, there's another uh, question here that I think it's always, it, we're both teachers, right? So it's, it's worth uh, addressing some of these. I know we have just a little time left, but one of the uh, themes about blood quantum and skin tone and people making assumptions and people having to sort out identity um, there's just a kind of a question there saying if, if there's a way to talk about how you included that in the book. I find it amazingly helpful by putting it in a story and seeing a character deal with those issues. I know I have students for whom this comes up all the time and it gives them a way to even, you know, kind of think through their own situation a little bit. Yeah, I, I did that specifically because I just so many of my former students have, and my own, and my children, you know, have grappled with ident- um, indigenous identity. And I just, it, there's so many parts to that. There's so many different things to it that I, I just telling it in a story and like Lily, you know, she's a dark skin Ojibwe girl, but half her blood quantum doesn't count because the tribe doesn't accept any records from over in Canada, which, you know, our families were connected before there was an international border. Um, You know, so putting that in there. And then Donis, you know, her father's Ojibwe, but her father's not on her birth certificate. So just the different ways that enrollment can impact a person's life and identity and just wanting different situations to show you know to mm-hmm. to have people thinking about that what if your identity was solely based on a piece of paper um, right who does that make you mm-hmm. right and how important it is to find your story and know your story and you know understand yeah. that I think and really not be defined by others I definitely see that in the characters too so I know we're getting really close to the end here. I don't know if people have. Know. We can, can we go over? Or are we limited to the hour? I don't, I don't know. We have to ask Dan. Can. I, I don't. You can. We can. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> yeah. Keep going. <laughs> so yeah, let's see if there are people comment, commenting about how they appreciate the conversation and also a number of folks who had said there are things that in their families as well, they believe in. And families, you know, have traditions like that. Things that when you believe in them, they, they're true. I mean, they offer comfort. They, uh, they actually add to our, our lives. We have at the school, um, the, the school in Franklin, Wisconsin was designed by Chris Cornelius, an Oneida architect. And one of the things that he did, the lower grades are on the first floor 
and the upper grades, like the, it's only first through eighth grade, the upper grades are on the upper floor and there's an area where the floor is glass so they can look up and actually see. So you kind of can re, you know, reflect on the fact that I'm gonna get older or when you're older, I was younger, right? And then also, especially when you get a tour from the kids because uh, you know, before COVID, the kids themselves would give the tours and there are long, thin white lights that go along the wall and I, it, it's just always so fun to hear the kids give the tour because they'll say, in this school, our hallways are curved. They aren't straight the way they might have been in a boarding school. They aren't um, putting us on a straight and narrow path. They're putting us on a wide curvy path. And those lights along the way are to remind us of our ancestors. And I always thought, you know, it's the storytelling part. Whatever image causes you to remember that you've got spirits and ancestors and presence sort of in this life that isn't always tangible or visible in the way people expect. Um, it's really important, I think, for kids to hear stories that, that have that and not, like you say, not just write it off as sort of magical realism every single time. Mm -hmm. um, there's another question here about, do you have a recommendation for books about the removal of children to the homes um, to, or to really boarding schools? where they had to live. And so this, this person says, I've read a few books that touched on this, but I haven't found one that explores this in depth. Um. Um, so, well, Marcy Rendon, she writes books for adults, but they're like right on that cusp of the yeah. upper young adult. Her book, Murder on the Red River, is a story mm -hmm. about 19 year old Cash Black Bear. And Cash is, was um, a foster was in the foster care system and it's set in the 70s and Marcy is such a beautiful storyteller and and so I, I highly recommend people read that there's a couple of books that are come that are recently out um, that I haven't read yet but I'm so excited to and one of them is called probably Ruby by Lisa Bird Wilson uh, mm -hmm. out from a Canadian publisher and um and that one is about the being adopted out um mm -hmm. I, I think if you honestly if you get on google or you get on do an internet search and you just type in indigenous stories about you know adopting out about boarding schools you're gonna right. come you're gonna you know find lists or suggested titles a lot of those are going to be from canadian uh, from mm -hmm. First Nations authors in from Canadian publishers, and please, you know, uh, check those out too. So, um, yeah, I would also think of um, Richard Wagamis as an yeah. author who has several yeah. books. Um, Brenda Child has written about boarding school and about women during those times. Yeah. Um, there are also, um, you know, stories where there's one by Peter Razor who talks about being adopted out and having to live as almost an indentured worker on a farm in Minnesota. He actually is an author who lives in Wisconsin now. He's from Fond du Lac. Um, so yeah, there are, there are a lot of stories and yeah. the stories are not all the same, you know, and so I think we have to, we learn, you have to validate. I can think of many elders who would say, I went to boarding school and it was not ideal and I had to assimilate in some ways but for me at the time my parents did what they thought was keeping me safe so to your point we're a thing that um it there are schools that were terrible that were just awful but then you have you know Basil Johnston writing about Indian school days every now and then you have an elder who says for me I got something out of it so it really is important to you know, read a lot of different stories. There's no one story about that time period, I think. And um, Indian Horse, the movie, right. uh, based yeah. on the book, it's it's devastating. I've only watched it once. That's all I can watch it. But yeah. uh, I recommend it, but it's so heavy on my heart. Um, mm -hmm. And then the Merrill Thieves book by Cherie Dimeline. Um, and it's set mm. futuristic where something happens and people lose the ability to dream, but indigenous people can still dream. And so, uh, you know, the main character is a 14 year old boy named Frenchie who's on the run mm -hmm. because they're trying to capture, um, you know, indigenous people 
to take their bone marrow because they think that's where the dreams are held. And, wow. and just such a powerful, powerful story. Yeah, there is so much out now. Um, I know another one, a film that's coming out in November is Antlers, and it's based on a Wendigo story. It's mm. based on sort of climate change and the earth wanting to sort of get people to reckon with what they've done about it. And they actually asked for a little introduction to the movie. So if you watch the trailer for Antlers, you hear this kind of creepy voice in the background saying things about the earth kind of rising up. And they had asked for that all in Ojibwe. So um, that was a thing that we also had worked on helping folks with. I think that our stories are being told more accurately. You know, when people think back to that old Hiawatha, Hiawatha was a crazy merger of Iroquois, Ojibwe, Dakota. It was all just like thrown together. And for a lot of people, those Hiawatha plays and that Longfellow poem is what they thought you know, was Indian monolithic culture. And so it's really nice to see these things get sorted out and people kind of learn, well, this is, you know, in Dakota way is completely different than it would be if you're telling it from an Ojibwe standpoint and everything. Yep. So yeah, and, and there, read lots. <laughs> there can be no single great Native American story because we are not a monolith. Right. And, and so I think once you, you know, figure out that yes. and why, then okay, yeah. then that's a starting point. There's no one boarding school story. There's no right way for people to reclaim or remember their language, any of that. It's all the different, different paths. Um, yeah, so there's one person saying, I guess we'll have to follow up with, I can work with Daniel to make the list of things we've mentioned, kind of go through, make sure they're, they're all found. Um, I know we're getting right up on, on eight o'clock if people have any other questions or if there was anything else. Oh, there's some people have been putting them in chat and some people put them in Q&A. And that was actually, um, people asked if the recording is available later. I will, yes, and we see that uh, Daniel at Boswell says we should be able to send this out with a link to the recording. So the list of readings, hopefully we're inspiring people to read even more. Mm -hmm. uh, and the, the recording of this will also be available. So, yeah. Yeah. yeah, I don't know if there's more that you want to bring up. Or... I just, I'm just so fortunate. I'm so thankful for, you know, the book landing the way that it has and the chord that it's striking with people, uh, not just Native readers, but, um, you know, I have non-Native readers who will reach out to me in my uh, DMs on my social media channels and they'll, um, They'll tell me something that, that, you know, that was very profound and how they connected to the story. And, yeah. and that is one of the things that has been a pleasant surprise to me is, and, and I guess it's true, you know, the Irish writer James Joyce wrote in the particular, we find the universal. And, and so that Donis's story can be so particular and yet resonate with so many people. Um, I'm very, very thankful for that. Yeah, definitely. There's one last one that someone added. Have you witnessed stories of the book helping Native readers become more proud of their heritage and identity? I've had a couple of situations where Ojibwe women have come up to me at book signings or different in-person mm -hmm. events, which I'm, I'm doing a few of them in Michigan. Um, and I've even gotten some private messages from people who will reach out to me on social media. And when I meet, it's, it's happened a couple of times where a woman will come up to me and she can't even get the words out. Mm. but she lets me, I can just see it in her eyes. And she like tries to say that she felt seen in the book, that she'd never seen herself or her life experience um, portrayed in a, in a story. And, and like that, I, you know, that I, that I did that. And, um, and that is just, to me, that's so heartfelt. And it, you know, because I, I 
think, you know, did I get it right? Did I make you proud? Did I, you know, is there any, did I not do any harm? Did Mm -hmm. I like, you know, as a writer, you think you have a responsibility to the words that you put out there. Um, and, and just hearing, seeing that type of reaction from, from Nishkwewag, um, just, uh, means the world to me. And I'm very appreciative and yeah. That's yeah. I, I, I would agree. The people that I, uh, encourage to read it, I will usually, as soon as they start reading it, kind of few pages in I'll get a text or a call or they'll contact this is so real it's so real and I think you're right about people feeling so visible it, it does yeah. make a big difference yep. um well there's... let me let me leave our viewers with um oh we're at 903 or 803 yeah. with me. so um if book one was indigenous Nancy Drew book two uh-huh. is indigenous Lara Croft Oh. And the main character is reclaiming ancestral remains and sacred items from museums and private collectors oh. to bring back home. And in the course of one of her heists, things go very badly. And it's not a traditional sequel per se, but it's set in my tribal community and you will see some familiar faces. Excellent. Excellent. That's so fun. Um, yep. And then I... I know, Daniel, you'll send things out for folks. We had a few questions about um, one comment saying, thanks for the healthy relationship subtext, which I would also second, and wanting to know a little bit more about ethnobotany. Um, we, can, we can definitely add some titles that if you're sending out readings for folks and then uh, maybe make sure people know how to find you because you are also all over Instagram. We have Ojibwe <laughs> net Ojibwe underscore net on Instagram and my daughters immediately like they they managed that channel for me and they connected with you and it's been it's been so fun for them to see oh look mom in her reading she's wearing heartberry earrings or whatever it might be you know they start making connections exactly all the way down to you know all of the ways women can be visible and present you are just an amazing role model. It's just been a pleasure to talk to you and what a real treat. We also will put our page. I have a a wonderful second year student that is helping me create our page online so that folks who want to be sure that they had fun with the language in the book will have that available on Ojibwe.net as well. So I'm on Instagram and uh, Facebook as uh, uh, Angeline Bully and I'm on Twitter as at Fine Angeline Fine, Angela. Oh, so. <laughs> nice. Yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And my stuff is all on Ojibwe, either on Facebook, it's Ojibwe.net. And that's our Facebook page. And then our website and then the Instagram too. We just have Ojibwe net because we're just trying to get people to speak Ojibwe all the time. <laughs> Inspired by Helen and your dad and others who are trying to live up to what they told us to do. Yep. So, well, this has just been such a treat. Uh, it's just been so nice. We're so honored, so grateful. Thank you, everybody, um, for joining us. Hope to see you. Miigwech and Bamapi. Bamapi.